Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bend. My name is Debbie Boone, and I am your host today, and I'm so excited to have somebody I have wanted to meet personally for a long time, and that is Dr. Marie Holacek. And I just got through telling her I would have found her at a conference somewhere if I'd have been able to come and find her in person because I'm so uh, admir- ad- uh, I admire her and her work so much in um, veterinary profession and well-being. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for taking your time out of your extremely busy schedule to meet with me today and to share your journey on the bend. Oh, Debbie, thank you so much. It's it's truly my pleasure to be here. I was sharing with you that that I certainly admire you and all that you've done. You're definitely someone I look up to in the wellness and communication space. So I was honored when you reached out and said that you would like to interview me. So this is I'm like all giddy about this. Oh boy! So, so we wait. we have a we have fangirling going on here on both directions. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> For those of you who uh, are not aware, um, Dr. Holowacek is a board certified uh, small animal emergency and critical care specialist. Now, if you ever sit in a hot seat, this is the hot seat of veterinary medicine because I've managed veterinary emergency for three and a half years. And I can tell you, it's either feast or famine. You're sitting there going, gosh, what's going on? Or, oh my God, what is going on? And Katie barred the door, it all piles in. And she's been doing that for 15 years, but also she has certifications as a coach. She is um, a yoga and meditation teacher. She is uh, compassion fatigue, has compassion fatigue training. So anyway, we're going to talk about her, her medical background some, but we want to dig into her mental and coaching and yoga and mindfulness stuff, because that is what, what makes me excited about knowing her. So uh, let's talk about how you got started and what made you decide to go into emergency. Oh, such a good question, Debbie. Great place to start. So um, it's interesting, you know, I, I grew up working in my mom's small animal general practice. So both my parents are veterinarians. And from a young age, you know, I was working after school on the weekends and really loved a lot of things about general practice, you know, getting to connect with these families over multiple generations and develop real relationships with our clients. And, you know, all that said, I felt, you know, when I got to my third year of vet school that I just really wanted to explore some other facets of vet medicine. And I wasn't really sure what that was going to look like. But I decided to apply for a small animal rotating internship. And so I um, matched with Washington State University, and they have a very busy emergency service. They're pretty much the only show in town for miles um, out in that southeast corner of Washington State. And so I fell in love with emergency. It was super exciting. I love being able to make decisions on my own. I liked the pace of it. I liked the challenge. And my mentor was a small animal emergency and critical care specialist. And so we just really connected and I just started reading everything I could. People would laugh at me. I always had this like stack of papers on my little intern desk, you know, just constantly learning and decided to do a residency after that. And so I matched with North Carolina State University. My alma mater. <laughs> oh, love it. Those were honestly, if I think three, three of some of the best years in my life. It was an amazing experience. I loved living in Raleigh. Um, I'm still very close with my mentors, and I still have have some of my best friends are in North Carolina still. So 
Um, that was wonderful. And yeah, I mean, the love continues. I, you know, emergency, it's not for everyone. It's not. For sure. It's not. You have to always laugh. So you have to be a little bit of an adrenaline junkie to yep. like the, the jazz of it. And it Absolutely. is instant decisions and managing the clients, I think is probably one of the most challenging things. And some of that, um, I, I got to experience firsthand as working the front desk and trying to calm people down and figuring out how to get them to pay for stuff. And even when it was not what we would consider an emergency, not a real emergency, it's still an emergency to the client and they're still upset. So being able to calm them down and move through the casework. And then, you know, there was a learning curve. Our hospital was a really new emergency hospital. It was general practice during the day. And at six, we switched over to ER. And we also had um, board certified ophthalmologist and internal medicine specialist. And one of our mixed animal practice practitioners was uh, boarded in equine. So we had specialists on staff too, but it's, um, it, we had to learn how to do all that stuff. We had to learn how to communicate with our referrings. And there's, I think that's really important because you really in emergency and critical care have two sets of clients, not just the one for general practitioners. And I love what you said though about growing up in general practice because I worked in my first hospital for 19 years and you get to see generations of pet owners. Like these kids were coming in and they were 10 years old and then then they were 20 and they had kids of their own and dogs of their own. And it was just really gratifying to be part of their family for that long. Yeah. But um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how you kind of morphed into doing this dual career because you have still doing emergency and critical care stuff, but you're also really helping veterinary team members and veterinary professionals with their mental health. How did, how did you, Get over there. Yeah, such a good question. Again, you know, it, it's uh, a bit of a, a long story and I'll try and keep it as short as possible. But, you know, a lot of it for most of us, of course, stems from our own experiences and our own challenges. And I, um, you know, I've lived with uh, mental illness for most of my adult life. I, especially it, it sort of really showed up during my residency. I had to euthanize my dog uh, towards the end of my residency and really, fell into a pretty dark depression and um, struggled as well with anxiety. And that really hasn't, um, didn't really come to my full awareness, you know, until, until I got older and really recognized it for what it was. Um, but that has sort of, that's been something I've worked on and, and carried through throughout most of my career. And hindsight is, is everything. But when I got into my faculty position at the Ontario Vet College, I loved my job. I loved everything I was doing. I loved the research, the teaching, the being on clinics, but also being off clinics and getting to focus on other projects. And I loved the variety of it, which is probably why I love emergency and critical care because it's so, um, you know, the cases are just so variable and unpredictable. But, you know, I struggled when I was um, in academia. I struggled with what I recognize now to be burnout um, and at sometimes compassion fatigue. And at the time, I didn't know that's what it was. I just thought, gosh, I don't feel happy. I feel anxious all the time. I, this doesn't feel right to me. I don't feel like this is sustainable. I don't think I can go on like this. I don't think I'm qualified like to do this work. Like for some reason, it just felt like um, I wasn't a good enough fit for the work, but I didn't recognize that there was underlying issues that I just wasn't tending to. And so, you know, I made a, a, a difficult decision to leave academia, despite really enjoying the work that I was doing. And everybody was shocked. You know, I was almost um, tenured and people were like, but you love this work and you're so good at it. Like what's going on? And I was like, I don't know. I just, I need a change and I need to be closer to my family and, and this, that, and the other. And so I moved back out West um, to be closer to my family and my friends that I had grown up with and started my own business as a locum critical care specialist and speaker thinking, oh, it'll be easy and I'll just do this and I'll get to travel and teach and do all these things I love to do. 
But because I hadn't really dealt with that underlying stuff, um, things got worse for a period. My depression got worse. Um, I started to have more anxiety about decisions I was making and the work that I was doing or, or struggling to do at that time. And, um, you know, I really uh, started to delve deeper into therapy to really un earth some of those things that I was dealing with and that I hadn't been dealing with and, um, you know, started to make some significant changes in my life. I really delved deeper on the advice of my physician into mindfulness-based stress reduction um, therapy. So a lot more meditation and mind-body awareness and a deeper yoga practice and body scans and, you know, all of these things, learning more about our brains and how they work and the fight or flight response, but not on the veterinary physiologic level, but like which part of our brains are operating and how do we get ourselves out of that primitive brain response and more into that cognitive, you know, prefrontal cortex um, decision-making response. And so a lot of learning, a lot of growth. I ultimately moved to Calgary to delve more into a, a combination of clinical practice and um, speaking. And I was in a really bad car accident um, just a few months after moving to Calgary. And I ended up, um, I was okay, but my car was totaled. I had some injuries that I had to work through with physio and otherwise. But it really caused me to take a step back. And it kind of felt like a sign from the universe, if you know what I mean. Like it was like, okay, I'm falling into these same patterns. I'm feeling the sense of anxiety and burnout again. I've made some steps forward, but I feel like I'm still on that same hamster wheel. And so ultimately, I ended up using some of the money from the um, car accident settlement to um, do my yoga teacher training. And it was during my yoga teacher training that I was reading and just exploring all of these different things and was seeing such a change in myself. And I thought, this is amazing. I feel so different. I have learned all of these incredible things in the last, you know, you know, year, six months, et cetera. I want to share this with the veterinary community. And so that's when I started offering yoga retreats and workshops around well-being. And I started speaking on well-being. I started doing other certifications, reading lots of books, listening to podcasts, doing every, you know, <laughs> sucking it all up like a sponge, you know, like just like I did during my internship. I think this is a pattern for you. I, I'm yeah. seeing this soaking up stuff. And I am, I am so with you because when I read my first book, I still have it back here. And it was um, about brain science. It was given as a speaker gift at the AHA conference years ago. And it just, my lights went off and I went, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is it. This is what I didn't know. The part that was missing, I kind of instinctively knew a lot of it. But then when you start to figure out how your brain is really sabotaging you so many times that you, you kind of learn to step back and go, oh, Oh, there's that false story I'm telling myself. There's that imposter syndrome kicking in again. I'm not going to accept that. Or even when you have um, those difficult clients who are coming at you, the story that you say, this is me, this is my fault. This is something that I'm doing wrong. Instead of going, no, this is, this is them. This is the story they're telling themselves. This is, this is even rooted in the past of whatever has happened to them. It's not about right now. This is just what triggered it, but it's about all the things that have, they have going on in the past. So I think once you start to learn that stuff, and I, I do try to teach it um, to student to my students, is that you you're you have that ability to kind of step back and look at yourself. And that's the other thing that mindfulness and yoga. If people don't learn anything from yoga except yoga breathing then they are going to be so far ahead of the game. Just just that box breathing just in, hold it out. Whoo, yeah. And then let, then let me go and do whatever it is that I need to do. But yes, that, that pause is amazing. Um, so, so tell me about your workshops and tell me, you know, that's, it's gotta be a little scary. Obviously the car accident was really scary, but anytime you start something new, there's some bravery involved in it. And that's really the story of this podcast is about bravery, how we step into things that scare us a little bit and then they actually turns out to be a wonderful thing that happened you're right the universe aligns and we get where we should be 
Yeah. What a beautiful way to put it. And I have to be honest, it was terrifying. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who's a veterinarian, but she has kind of, you know, stepped out of the industry and is pursuing other things. And she was like, I think you just have to do it. And it's not going to be perfect the first time. It probably will never be perfect. And you'll continue to change it and morph it and grow it. Cause I was like, but I, 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 I'm not ready. Like it's, I've got to figure out this and this and this and this. And, and I, I don't know that we're ever ready when we really jump into something new. Like, it's like having kids too. It's like, well, are you ever really ready? I don't think so. You kind of learn as you go. Well, it's, it was the same thing with this. And I have changed my offerings tremendously over the last five or six years since I started doing them. I've learned new things about the people who attend, what resonates with them, what works for them. Um, And I've learned and grown as a facilitator and as a coach and as a speaker. And so it's constantly evolving, but it is, it's amazing. And just the opportunity to share what has worked for me, um, you know, and just to be able to resonate with the audience. And I think, you know, this having spent so much time in practice as well, like you've lived it, you understand it at a deep level. Mm -hmm. And so you can really talk the talk and, and really share with individuals what you know to be true in terms of what has worked for you. Um, and it's just, it's amazing. I mean, connection is so important to me. Vulnerability is one of my core values as well. And so being able to share, helping others to feel vulnerable to share, that builds a sense of connection amongst the group and the growth that comes from that is just exponential. It's amazing. Let's let's talk a little bit about perfectionism, because I think this is probably one of our biggest challenges in veterinary medicine. I um, have a practice that has a new grad coming out, and she's she's afraid to fail. And I said to the practice, you have got to have this discussion with her, is that it is absolutely all right to make a mistake, and it is absolutely all right to confess your mistake, because if not, She's going to feel like she's always got to be perfect and perfect is not possible ever. We all make mistakes. I I laughed and said many years ago when I was supposed to be filling in at the front desk, I forgot to come to work. I was the manager. I was the hospital administrator. I've been working here 15 years and I forgot to show up for work. And, and so I didn't go through and say, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't plan on coming. I took myself out of the sky. I went, no, you know what? I didn't forgot. I flat out forgot. Confess your sins and move on because it makes you human. And you can confess your sins to your clients too. That's the other thing is they will forgive you if you've built that relationship. You, we're humans. Oh, I agree. It's, I mean, you and I, um, this is, I think, a passion for both of us. And it's amazing how it's just not normalized in the veterinary industry. I, you know, growing up with working in my mom's practice, I never, and I I don't often speak in, you know, like words like never and always and so on, but to date, I have never heard my mom say that she has made a mistake in veterinary practice. I don't feel like we model that Mm -hmm. to the younger generation very well. And I think for me, um, you know, especially when I was in academia and teaching students, I actually delivered a lecture on communicating medical mistakes. And I shared a story um, that I don't share widely. Well, I have, I mean, let's be honest, I wrote a blog about it. So it's out there. Out there. Um, but I, I share a story that happened to me where during my residency, I was involved in managing a patient. It wasn't my own case. It was a medicine case, but I was helping. And um, part of the management of that case was my recommendation to place a feeding tube. And so my team, one of my technicians placed the tube and through a myriad of miscommunications and and issues that were happening logistically in the hospital that day, um, there was an x-ray taken to confirm the tube placement and I misread the x-ray and it was a brief glance. I was rushed. It was the second time the tube had been placed and long story short, the tube was in the dog's airway Mm -hmm. and the dog got fed and the dog died. Mm. And that was on me. That was a mistake that I made. Now there was a plethora of things that went into that, but ultimately I made that mistake and I was 
devastated. I mean, after that, I was like, I don't deserve to finish my residency. I shouldn't be practicing vet medicine. Um, it was awful. And it wasn't until my mentor, it was like weeks or maybe even months later, and I was still struggling. And my mentor said to me, Marie, snap out of it. You're human. We all make mistakes. Do you know how many patients that I have killed in my career? And I was like, what? I mean, this was Bernie Hansen, the guru of emergency and critical care. He double boarded practicing for, you know, however many decades. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? And he was like, he goes, I, I can't, I've lost count of the number of times I've made mistakes, some of which have resulted in a patient's death. It's not anything we ever want, but it's something that happens and it's normal and it's okay. And I thought to myself, if I had known this, how many years ago, I would be talking to myself differently. I would be practicing differently. Like this fear and this pressure that we put on ourselves to always be perfect, as, as you said, it's not possible. And it can really impact our mental health um, dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think the other thing is that you, you're exactly right, is that we, even in school, um, the students are not taught that it's okay. I gave a lecture not too long ago to the VVMA at NC State, and it was called Professionalism in a Fishbowl. The fact that basically you're being watched a lot by your team, by your clients, by your fellow associates. And I said to them, something will die on your watch. Now, these are first, second, third years. And you could look at their faces and see that it had never occurred to them that they wouldn't be saving everything. And I said, I want you to get it in your mind because it will happen to you and you will have to work your way through it. Yeah. But it is a fact. You are not God and you can't fix everything. So go into it and do the very best you can, but forgive yourself if you can't. You know, if we're, And sometimes you're even not allowed to do your best because of financial constraints. So there's all that problem too that, that happens, especially... In, especially in big cases with the emergency and things are just, you know, falling apart a lot of times. But um, we talked about, you know, the fear of moving through. And, and it seems to me like you talk to some people that help you get over your fear and move through that. So let's talk a little bit about overcoming fear. And because I think so many people have so many, many opportunities in veterinary medicine. I see staff members complaining about this toxic work environment that they are living in and like you can get out of that but there's this big fear of the unknown that oh we know everything out there is like this everything out there is worse than this but you don't know until you take the risk and move out or if somebody is being verbally abusive or somebody is being inappropriate there's also the fear of walking up to that person and saying I just I don't like that. You know, you need to stop treating me this way and standing up for yourself. So let's talk about overcoming fear. How do you coach people to overcome those risks and that fear? Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, it's, uh, where, where do I begin? You know, it's, I think for me personally, um, a lot of it is my mindset, you know, how I talk to myself, like I said, um, you know, definitely um, having a lot of self-compassion as well in the process. Um, a lot of it too, it's just, it's, it's shifting away from that fear and, and really tapping into like, why is this so important to me? Like, what could this be? Like, yes, it might not be that and, you know, whatever, but anytime, especially when there's an unknown situation, it's like, but it could be amazing. I might love it. It might challenge me in ways I've never been challenged before. I might meet people that I never would have met before and they might enrich and change my life in amazing ways. Like, it's just about, um, I don't know, looking to the other side of it, like flipping the situation on its head and just giving it a new perspective. Reframing, I guess, is the you know, psychological term that people would use for that. So that's certainly been a big thing. 
I think too, you know, connecting with people who know me really well, um, people who know me on a deep level and not just within the veterinary profession, but outside of the profession. So they know me to my core. They know what I'm capable of. They know what's important to me. Um, they love me unconditionally, you know, and so just being able to connect with them and feel their love and encouragement and support and just knowing, you know what? they support me. I'm going to move forward in this. And if I fail, then you know what? I've got all these amazing people still behind me to catch me if that's the case. And I will move on and do something different. I think a lot of people in the industry, you know, we really pigeonhole ourselves into these roles. And, and I know for the longest time for me, it was like, I'm an academic and I can only move from this university to that university into that vet college. Like those are my options. And it's like, okay, but that that's not true. I don't have to only be in academia. There are other options out there. Um, and so really just, you know, taking a step back, seeing the big picture, and I think too, inevitably recognizing like life is not predictable. It's full of ups and downs. Um, things aren't always going to go our way, but everything is going to be okay. You know, in the end, ev everything will be okay. And if it doesn't work out, then I'll move on to something different. Like it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard to, you know, kind of put it into words how I've been able to do it. I think for me, when I'm coaching other people, when they're looking at making changes in their life, I really try to connect them with their core values and what is the most important to them. And, and that becomes their why. So, you know, some people feel so stuck in their like nine to five regular, you know, general practice job and just, you know, rigid and ah, it's, it doesn't work for me. And there's no, you know, flexibility in the schedule and da, 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 da. and then it comes out that, you know, freedom is one of their core values. They want freedom to travel. They want freedom to make their own schedule and they, this, that, and the other. And it's like, okay, so let's, let's build a life for you that is in alignment with that. Because the reason that you are feeling so stuck and so unhappy and so, you know, blah, right now is because you're not living in alignment with what is true to you at your core. So if I know for me, if I'm making decisions in alignment with that, that no matter what the outcome is, it's going to be okay. Good. That's true. Yeah. I I'm looking right here because my core value words are right in front of me and they stay by my, behind my computer monitor all the time. And I think spending the time to do that. That's one of the things a, a good coach can do is most, but I, you know, I didn't do these core values. I think I innately knew them, but I really didn't do them formally for many, many years. And everybody thinks, oh, this is a business thing. You know, you have to have a business in order to do these core value statements, but you, these are personal core values. This is what you are, um, how you're going to align your life and what is important to you. It is really, our, you know, our Simon Sinek, uh, why? Mm -hmm. And when people don't even know why they come to work every day, uh, other than for a paycheck, then of course, they're not going to be engaged or invested in their work. They're going to burn out because they don't really like what they're doing. And they don't feel a big purpose in, in making that effort to be uh, all that they can be and to grow in that profession. And this is one of the reasons I always encourage that the veterinary hospitals to build their core values. It's the foundation. It's the platform of everything because you want to hire people who believe what you believe. And when you do, everybody is in alignment and, and the work just flows because people all believe and, and they're all focused on the same thing. And then when that there is no alignment, there's dysfunction and because everybody's pulling in the different direction. And, and even if they're a great technician, if they, if they're, let's say they're especially hospital and what the average per case is $2,000. And they say, oh no, we think that it's a charity and everything should be given away for free. And this is our core values is that we want to help the indigent people and homeless pets. They're not in the right place. They're not, their core values are not aligned with the hospital, but if they want to be a VTS in emergency and critical care, they're, they're spot on. They're in the right spot. So these are the things that we need to learn to ask better questions about too. So we can pick people and work with people who believe what we believe and are carrying that same mission and banner forward. Otherwise we're going to struggle. Now, let's talk a little bit about networking, because I am a networking queen. Anybody says, 
Debbie, everybody knows you. Everybody knows. So I don't know if that's true, but I do love to know people because I am a people person. How did networking help you come out of academia and get into doing what you're doing right now? It's such a funny question, Debbie. You know, um, I, I don't. Are, are you extroverted or introverted? Oddly enough, I my personality is is slightly introverted, okay. and I'm high um, compliance. I have a little bit of driver, uh, but my S is very low. Okay. <laughs> when you're doing dis personality, my S is very uh, low. But I do uh, I do enjoy people. But I also go it being a hermit. If you can't see behind me because of this screenshot, uh, but there's like 400 books behind me. So I, I just love rooting around and hiding in a, in a book. Yeah. And I'm yeah. fine with that. But you love people. And that's I why I asked. People. I thought, gosh, the fact that you love people so much, I wonder if you're extra, but it sounds like you might be even like right on the cusp. I am on the cusp. I'm pretty close on the cusp as well, but I definitely tend towards introversion. Um, but uh, part of that, it's and it's not even, I guess, really the fact that I'm introverted and that I refuel on my own with books and podcasts mm -hmm. and other things. Um, I, I just, I, I, for the longest time, and it's probably my anxiety, I have a bit of like social anxiety, like meeting new people and talking to new people. And, and this is something I have really worked hard on, um, especially like in the last several years as I've branched out more as a speaker and a, you know, um, and a facilitator and so on. Um, but the thought of networking years ago was like, oh my gosh, that is like my worst nightmare, like being in a room full of people I don't know, and just having to start conversation and this, that, and the other. And so I'm not going to lie. Um, when I decided to leave my job and I knew I was going to have to network to like connect with new companies. And cause I mean, back then, I mean, that was, you know, that was a good seven or eight years ago now. Um, we weren't in this like position that we are now where we have such a deficit of veterinarians and, and so on. So there weren't a ton of like locum opportunities for me and other things. And I was still considering consulting and this, that, and the other. So long story longer, I was visiting a friend here in Calgary and I saw a book on their bookshelf on networking. I can't remember what it was called, but it was something like networking 101 or the basics of networking. And I was like, what is, what do you guys have this book for? And my friend was like, oh, you know, my husband, he just loves networking. It's like his jam. And so, and I was like, can I borrow this book? And so I read this book from cover to cover and it taught everything you need to know about like who's in your immediate circle and then who is their circle and their circle and just how you can get connected with different people. And so I went on a networking spree. Like I was sending emails to like my mentors and their mentors and friends of friends and connecting in any way, shape or form that I could mostly electronically via email. Um, I think if this had happened today, it would have been a whole lot of Zoom calls, but it was mostly emails followed up by phone calls. Um, and now I think now that I'm more comfortable in my own skin, I've, I've taken some steps, um, you know, with therapy to really help with my comfort around, um, group situations with a lot of people that I don't know. Um, and knowing as well, what I do know now about my tendency as an introvert, I do find it much easier to connect with people, especially one-on-one. -on -one. Like if I can come into a room, um, and find someone, um, and, and have a connection with them and, and have more of those deep conversations that us introverts really crave, um, then it's wonderful. And, um, and then just, yeah, connecting others with, I mean, I can't tell you, I probably on a weekly basis, I get some email from someone like, Hey, I thought you should know this person. So I'm connecting you guys. And I love stuff like that. And just, you know, getting to talk to new people and, oh, and that's another reason I love podcasts. Cause I get to hear these interviews and learn and meet all of these new people. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think years ago when I was young, I was really shy. And when people, I tell people that they just laugh because they weren't, you've got to be kidding. But no, really as a child, I was very shy. And then for some reason, it's just like, I had this epiphany that, you know, everybody feels the same way that I do. Everybody feels nervous about meeting new people. Nobody knows exactly what to say. So the best thing to do is just go and ask people, tell me about you. And then don't say anything. And then we'll think you're the best conversationalist in the world because people love to talk about themselves. And over the years, that has worked well for me. Plus, like you, I love connecting people. I love matchmaking. I love saying, oh, you should meet this one. And she has a tool that will help you do this thing. 
And it, it, to me, that's, you know, people think, oh, you, that networking has to be kind of skeezy, you know, that it has to be a benefit to you. This like used car salesman, glad handing stuff, but that's not it. To me, it is being able to know enough people to help more people. Because if I know what you do and I know the tools and the skills that you bring to the table and I can put you with somebody who needs those things, then that's really gratifying to me that I, I helped you both. And if we go at it and we look at networking and connecting, I like the, I, the connection idea is much more appropriate, I think, than networking, the traditional networking stuff, then I, people will see that it is not only, you know, it does benefit you, but it benefits your soul, not necessarily your pocketbook. But, and eventually I think it, it benefits your pocketbook because people like to help people that help them. And it just kind of, the universe works it out. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah, I love that. So tell us, you know, what career advice, if you were looking back when you were in your parents' practice, and you said, okay, here's the, here's the make or break point. What am I going to do for a living? What career advice would you give somebody who is in that position? Oh, you know, I think one thing, and we've, we've touched on it a little bit, but it's, you know, this idea that there is just like a one track um, route for anyone in veterinary medicine. And it's, you know, I'm going to be an equine practitioner. And so like, that's the route I'm going and that's my whole entire career set forth before me. And I would just tell people, you know, it's important to keep your options and your eyes and your ears open and keep your heart open. I mean, you don't know what opportunities are going to come up. And I think, you know, you and I have seen such a shift in the industry over the years where people are more open to change um, within our industry. We're being forced to change, quite frankly, but we're seeing all of these like new companies pop up, these tech companies, these, you know, companies that are, you know, in alignment with veterinary practices and veterinary industry, but they're not necessarily practice owners, but they do things to support vets. And is that a way that you could go? Could you start up your own company? Do you have some idea that's been, you know, burning inside of you or whatever it is? And certainly not everyone is an entrepreneur and not everyone is meant to, you know, blaze their own trail. But even, even as an employee, you don't necessarily need to be working in practice. You could be part-time practice, part-time industry. You could be doing regulatory stuff, volunteer stuff, philanthropy. I mean, there's so many different options and things that people can do. And I know for me, when I was feeling like that sort of like niggling need to like get out of academia, like, and it wasn't even getting out of academia. It was just like, blah, something isn't going well with me here. And I'm this, this isn't working for me. Um, I was so, you know, really stuck on like, what other universities could I go to? And what would those jobs look like? Um, versus thinking outside the box and just thinking, you know, and it took it took me a lot to really think about, um, you know, all the different things that veterinarians can do and all the different things that I could do as already a board certified specialist and with all of these other, you know, things that I had accomplished already in my career. So, yeah, I would just tell people, just keep your options open um, from a career perspective. Now, this is a great um, point to bring up in this moment as I get really hyper-focused on career is one thing that we have to remember, and I think you and I both know this and practice this, is if you want to be sustaining yourself in this career long-term, you have to, have to, have to prioritize yourself first. So um, really instilling people early on that it's okay to practice self-care. In fact, it's necessary to take care of yourself before you can do whatever job it is that you choose to do in this profession. And to really teach people, you know, self-care is not, you know, bubble baths and um, Netflix and wine and all the stuff that you see on Instagram. Self-care is, you know, in the weekend leading up to my, you know, four 12 hour shifts, I need to cook some healthy meals. I need to connect with my virtual therapist. I need to get outside for some exercise. Um, I'm going to prioritize sleep because I know I probably won't sleep as much this week. 
none of those things sound, especially to me, exciting or fun or whatever, but they are necessary to do the work that we do. Self-care is proactive. It's health promoting and it's necessary, not these coping strategies that we see a lot of people share on social media. I love that you said that because Kim Pope Robinson and I had this conversation and I said, do you not think that this makes people feel more guilty than they were before? Because now not only do they have to work, but it's almost like they're required to run 5Ks or that they have you know, these rules about what I have to do in my off time. Well, if you want to self-care sitting in a bubble bath reading a book, then do that. That's your if that's your mental escape and mental break. If you want to sit and do, you know, a, a 15 minute meditation, which is what I temp, attempt to do before I start my work day so that my mind is clear and calm and set for my work, then do that. But again, go to the grocery store and don't survive on fast food. Put some boundaries up that say, I'm going to go eat. I'm going to go pee no matter what's going on here. Because if you don't have your body to carry your mind, then pretty soon you are nothing. You're just a, you know, a talking head that, that can't sustain anything. <laughs> it's not going to do you any good. You got to be able to move around. And, a and talking I, so, head, I love yes, it. <laughs> sometimes we're just so, I, I laugh and say, you know, we, we might be burning out, but we're catching ourselves on fire. We, we do it. We yeah. do it. And we need to, we need to learn to say no. And that goes, you know, even in, when we're talking about practice and right now, everybody is so busy, so overwhelmed. There's so much work to be done. And I completely understand the fact that everybody wants to take care of animals that are sick. But I also understand that if you can't live, if you can't survive, if you're burning through staff and they keep quitting because you're overwhelming them by not being able to say no, then pretty soon no animals get care. And it's the same, the same philosophy I've told many, many practices about getting paid. If you don't get paid and if you don't pay your staff, then you don't exist. And then no animals get helped. And yeah, you want to help the few out here. Well, put systems in place, have things that are available, have foundations, have donors, have those things possible, but always get paid because if we don't get paid, we can't pay our teams. They can't live. Um, and financial stress is a huge stress for, for staff members. So figure out how to charge enough to pay your folks. Uh, that takes a whole lot of stress off when you don't have a revolving door of staff members that are going in and out and just you know constantly unhappy and looking for greener pastures. Uh, you be the green pasture and be the unicorn. That's great advice, Debbie. Mm -hmm. So tell us a fun fact about you, something that most people wouldn't know, a secret talent. Maybe you can turn yourself like a pretzel. You're a yoga instructor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably one of the most non-flexible uh, yoga instructors you'll ever see. Um, and that's okay. That's not what yoga is about. But yeah, I'm definitely not a pretzel yoga instructor. Um, I used to play the violin. Um, I played in the Edmonton Youth Orchestra when I was young. So, well, right up through high school. So was... Um, you know, quite adept at it. And I've actually played a lot of musical instruments in my life. So I played the standing bass, the oboe. Um, I occasionally tinker with my dad's drum set. And recently I started taking up the ukulele. So lots of different instruments. I love music. Um, it's, uh, yeah, a again, it's, you know, just that sort of wanting to be a lifelong learner and just learn new things and, and grow new skills and um and the ukulele is fun who wouldn't want to learn how to play the ukulele <laughs> it'll take you on a tropical vacation anytime you pick it up I think that's, that's right. a wonderful thing okay now so now I'm categorizing you as veterinary slash yoga instructor slash musician and this is important because when we have conferences, Deb Stone will loop us into playing <laughs> and singing. I forgot that Deb is musically inclined. That's well. right. So the Barking Cats, the Barking Cats play. And then if you are um, ever a member of the Vet Partners Association, we also have musical talent. 
And we have something called the No Low Profit Band. And we just play oh. once a year at the vet partners meetings. But we will we will play and sing. I love that. Given any that. opportunity. <laughs> now I'm sorry I shared that information. <laughs> That's, once we know it, we can't unknow it. Uh, Clint oh, Laban, who was a audience. former guest of mine, just started to play the banjo. Oh. And I went, oh, good. Now you too can come and play <laughs> because we have a mandolin player. And we have somebody who plays the drums and, and Deb plays the guitar and I sing. And so now we have a banjo wow. player and now we have somebody who can maybe turn the violin into a little fiddle. Yeah, there <laughs> you the go. Ukulele, which is probably, you know, more transportable to a conference. You don't want to be carrying big things to the conference, but maybe to the conference. Oh my gosh. All right. Any final words of wisdom? Uh, tell us a little bit about the programs that you have. Uh, available to people and we are going to put all your contact information at the in the show notes so people can make sure they can get in touch with you for coaching or classes or where you're going to be speaking. Thank you so much Debbie I appreciate that. You know I guess words of wisdom I um, having stepped recently back into clinical practice as well um, after my mat leave and focusing on my wellness endeavors um, it it is really clear that things are tough out there and that everyone is struggling. And um, I don't see things changing um, in the next few weeks, months. Um, I think it's going to be many years before we can catch up as an industry in terms of meeting the demand for pet care that is happening now. So I think we need to really look at this stretch as a bit of a marathon and to really put those boundaries in place, as you alluded to, to really prioritize self-care, to not be afraid to say no, to instill a bit of work-life separation, um, to give our brains and our hearts and our, our, our bodies a break from the work that we're doing. So Certainly for me coming back, I've been very intentional about how I'm doing that and what my limits are. And it's hard. It's hard for me as, as much as I preach it. It's also hard for me to say no um, and to set those boundaries, but it's, it's necessary. So I urge people to really um, give themselves permission to do that. And with that said, I would love for people to uh, follow me on social media. I'm on all the regular social media channels. I have a website. It's my name, MarieHollowayChuck.com, and people can visit me there. I've got blog posts. I recently um, started recording my Wellness Wednesday live videos and putting them into podcast format. So if you like to just listen rather than watch, um, Reviving Vet Med is my podcast. And I just love it when people reach out. I mean, even if it's just to share what, what you're struggling with right now, it helps me to know like what sort of content to talk about and, and, and what it is that people are needing. Um, so reach out, say hi, share the highs, the lows, the wins, whatever. And I really am just so grateful to you, Debbie, for having me on your show. And this has been so much fun. It has I can't been fun. We can it's, see each other in person. Yeah. It, it, and hopefully, hopefully soon, we just keep struggling along, but that's okay. But I just do encourage people to, uh, to take you up on your offer to reach out. There's so many good tools available. Um, you and I are both here to help and we are absolutely uh, going to coach you as best we can through what I, I agree with you. We're, we're in for a year or two of a really hard slog. It's not going to get any better until we reorganize ourselves and realize that um, we, we've got to treat our people better and we probably need to bring in some more diversity, I know we do, into our world because we are, we are self-limiting. Uh, yeah. So when we learn to do that and we, we embrace change and we embrace difference, um, and we're gonna have to, we have no choice, no option whatsoever about it, and we will sink or swim. And let's hope that we swim and win gold, yay, to the Olympics. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for spending time with us today. And we'll have all of Dr. Holowacek's information in the show notes. And we thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And we um, hope that you will be mentally and physically well and enjoy 
spend your time enjoying life. Think positive, look for positive things, put your gratitude list up and learn to say no.